You're listening to the Allied Health Financial Podcast, evidence-based finance education for allied health professionals. Hello, and welcome to the Allied Health Financial Podcast. I'm Giacomo. As always, I've got Ryan here with me. How's it going today, Ryan? Things are good. The New Year's off to a good start, and we keep rolling at Allied Health Financial. Yeah, big things coming in 2022 where I can selfishly say that both you and I are hard at work getting things ready for this 2022 that hopefully we're going to be able to unveil quite soon. But for now, I think we'll talk about something that's on a lot of people's minds at this time of year, and that's the wonderful world of taxes. Some people might say that it's a little early to be thinking about tax season, but as you and I both know, it is never too early to be thinking about tax season. So don't forget that the end of February or typically March 1st is the last day to make an RRSP contribution and the last day to file your tax return is at the end of April. So to plan these things out, it's never a bad idea to take a look in January and say, okay, how much room do I have left in my RRSP? Do I want to make some contributions to offset some of my taxable income? Making these decisions now can really set yourself up for success so you can optimize your returns. Yeah, definitely. And I've I've never heard an accountant say, I hate it when my clients give me too much time to work on their taxes. I mean, the more time you can give your accountant to, to put things together, the faster you can file and either, you know, if you're an employee, potentially get a return. If you're a contractor, I guess you'll know what the damage is at the end of the year. Um, but you can kind of get those things taken care of, get something off your plate, and potentially focus on some of the more fun things that you can do with your money in 2022. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I can say from experience, especially in the early days when I used to do my own tax returns, it takes me six to seven hours to get the receipts in order to categorize them all and to set everything up on something like a TurboTax. I am much more happy these days to just categorize the receipts, send it off to the accountant, let them do the work. It is money really well spent. And she's able to save me a lot more than I ever was on my own. So the earlier we get started, the better. And hopefully it doesn't take you that much time anymore because you're using the tax tracker that's included in the Allied Health Financial Toolkit. If you don't have that and you're listening to this, just go to the website, click the button that says get the toolkit, completely free. We'll just send it to your inbox and it has a pretty helpful tool that honestly, if you can start at the beginning of the year, get, you know, maybe one day a week or one day a month where you're tracking all this stuff and, you know, categorizing your receipts and putting things in envelopes or however you want to do it. Um, it can really save you a ton of time at the end of the year. But I guess we'll we'll stop talking about how to, you know, track your taxes and maybe get into the meat of this episode. So what do we owe at the end of the year and what do we need to calculate it? So at the end of the year, come April, you are responsible for remitting three things. Number one, federal tax. Number two, provincial tax. And then the one that everyone always forgets about, which is CPP premiums and employment insurance premiums. You can never forget about those. They're pesky and they do add a little bit more to what you owe. So if you are doing a quick calculation, you have to go for more than just the provincial and federal taxes. To be able to calculate what you owe, you're going to need four things. Number one, how much you made that year, your employment or your self-employment income. Number two, your RRSP contributions. So because March 1st is the last day where you can make RRSP contributions for the previous year, it started on March 2nd of 2021, and then it runs all the way until this year, March 1st, 2022. That time period, it's kind of annoying in that way where your RRSP contributions for one calendar year count as this kind of altered or shifted year on dates. Number three, you're gonna need any capital gains or dividends that were paid to you as long as they were from a non-registered account. So that is money that was made outside your TFSA or RRSP. And then lastly, you're going to need a total of the income taxes you've already paid. If you are an employee, they are taken off your paychecks by your employer. And if you're self-employed, then you're likely remitting quarterly installments to the Canadian Revenue Agency. And I'm sure if you're listening to this as an employee, you're thinking, well, I don't I don't really need to think about any of this stuff. And, you know, as an employee myself, I can tell you that you do, you know, that CPP and EI premiums, those are taken care of for you really, as are your taxes, but you'll need to have all this information from your T4 in order to file your taxes. 
And then the RRSP contributions, whether you're an employee or an independent contractor, are really the same. You're going to have to track those things. There's no document your employer is going to provide you or your, your accountant can get for you. This is all information that you are going to have to get for them. So really important things to keep track of. Yeah, and absolutely. Don't forget that even you and I were surprised when we were doing the research on tax deductions for salaried employees and commissioned employees. And we were kind of blown away with just how much you can actually deduct and save at the end of the year. So it's definitely important. That's very true. And if you want to learn more about those tax deductions, check out episodes 51 and 52 of the tax series, and they'll take you through some of those deductions. Um, Another good episode to listen to would also be episode 81, kind of taking you through the pros and cons of using an accountant. And of course, we'll link to all of those things in the show notes so you have easy access to them. So we should probably go through all those categories that you mentioned, Ryan, and talk about how they work and how to calculate them. So let's start with employment income. Yeah. So for employment income, we just want to do a quick recall that your net income equals your gross income minus any deductions that you would make. So let's say if you were to bring home $100,000, your employer paid you $100,000, that $100,000 would be your gross income. If you deduct, let's say, $10,000 off of that, then your net income becomes $90,000. So pretty simple math there. To find this gross income number, you can either tally up all of your paychecks or you can take a look at your T4 if you're an employee. Deductions are anything that come off your income So what you're going to want to do is get all of your receipts in order. And you can, once again, you can use that tax tracker to categorize all of the receipts and collect the relevant totals. So for deductions, some quick examples are self-employment or employment write-offs. Those previous episodes we mentioned will have all the information you want on through there. And some of those ones that we often think about are advertising costs, cost of supplies, professional accounting fees, all of these things you can actually deduct from your income. And then for tax credits, these are things like your first-time home buyer's cost, student loan interest, and any charitable donations that you make. What you're going to want to do is calculate the total deductions and subtract to give you the net income as per that equation that we gave you earlier. And then you can take all of that information and you can plug it into any kind of tax calculator that you can find on Google. So if you do a quick Google of tax calculator, it will provide you with a template that you can input your total income made, any tax that you paid, any RSP contributions, so on and so forth. And you can plug in all this information we're going to run through here. And it will tell you generally how much you owe in taxes, both provincial, federal, and those CPP and EI deductions. So if you make $80,000 a year and you had $5,000 in deductions, that gives you a net income of $75,000. And the difference in taxes between those two is $1,600. So for collecting your receipts, making sure you have all this information, you're saving yourself a good amount of money. Yes, definitely worth the six to seven hours to categorize those receipts for an extra $1,600. I'd take that any day. If we move on, how does an RRSP contribution help us lower the taxes we owe? Great question. So an RSP contribution will help to lower the taxes you owe because you're going to take a portion of your income and you are going to put it into account before you pay taxes on it. So you're basically going to defer that tax obligation until you decide to withdraw the money, which hopefully is when you retire. So let's say once again, you make $100,000. If you take $10,000 and you put it into your RRSP, then the government's basically going to say, great, you made $90,000, we'll charge you the tax on that. And that $10,000 you put into the account, it can grow for the next 30, 35 years. And we will charge you tax on that when you take it out on the other side. The benefit of that, just as a reminder, is that typically you're making less than you are making currently right now. So you're paying a lower tax rate on the money when you take it out on the other side. Don't forget that you can calculate your RSP contribution and that is how much you're able to put in for that year. And you can find that information on your CRA online account or your T1 from the previous year will tell you your max contribution allowance for that for this current year. Then your last step is to sit down and say, okay, let's say I have $15,000 in RSP room and I've only put in $8,000. You can use that additional room between now and March 1st to lower your taxable income by putting a higher contribution inside your RRSP and keep more of your money, but you have to kind of work out the math on that. 
both really, really important concepts to keep in mind. And it just goes to show you how powerful of a tool an RRSP can be both to lower your taxable income now and then defer taxes on growth on investments over time. It's a really powerful tool to help grow your retirement nest egg. Those concepts can be a little bit complicated. And I feel like we're mentioning a lot of other episodes to listen to, so you may have a list at the end of this episode. But if you check out the Ultimate Guide to RRSPs, um, that's episode 50. And then our question period on how RRSP contributions are made with pre-tax income, we go into a little bit more detail about these things. And yes, there is more detail about these things. Um, And again, you can check those out in the show notes so you have access to those podcasts as well really important things to to take advantage of because they can be really helpful both in lowering your taxes and increasing that nest egg at the end of the day. Since there's a lot of math involved in that last step, why don't we use an example to illustrate that fact a bit? So in this example, we are going to use the fact that you made $75,000 in 2021. If you made $75,000, then you are going to owe the government $20,400 in tax, and that is provincial federal, and CPP and EI premiums inclusive. Now, if you made a $10,000 RRSP contribution, that's lowered to $17,400. So you have two options on the extremes. And remember that you can do anything in between these from paying $0 in your RRSP and maxing out your RRSP. Option one, pay $20,400 straight to the government. You don't have to worry about it. It's all said and done, but all that money is just gone from your account. Or you can pay $17,400 to the government and invest $10,000 of your own money into your RRSP. Now, in that option, it's going to cost you an extra $7,000 to do that. So you have to fork over in a way $7,000 extra dollars, even though you get to keep the $10,000 for yourself, although you can't touch it right now unless it's under a few stipulations, like you're buying a home in your first-time home buyer's plan, or you're returning to school and you want to use those RSP funds that way. So think about it like this. You pay $7,000 and you get to invest $10,000. When would you not want to do this? If you need access to your money sooner. So putting the $10,000 into your RRSP for something that is a big purchase, but it's not necessarily going back to school or purchasing a home, then you may be better off paying the government their money and then taking that extra $7,000 and putting it inside your TFSA. Yeah, that's a really good way to think about it. I mean, uh, when you're not contributing to your RRSP, you're technically keeping more money on the other end of it because you're not having to put the extra money into your RRSP. But when you're making that RRSP contribution, 10,000 of those dollars are coming to you. You're not paying them to someone else. You're you're technically paying yourself in in 20 or 30 years. So even though that initial quote unquote bill that you're paying seems to be $7,000 higher, it's really you're paying the government $3,000 less and you're getting to invest $10,000. So it's really it's a win-win for sure. Now, let's say that you've been able to you know, you've maxed out your RSP, maybe you've maxed out your TFSA and you've got extra money to keep investing and you've been able to put that into a taxable account. And although this may not be relevant for everybody, how do capital gains and dividends in these accounts get taxed? So if you are in this category and you've been doing this well, give yourself a pat on the back. You're doing absolutely outstanding. If you have this problem, it is a good problem to have. So remember, this is only for investments outside of a registered account, so outside that RRSP and outside that TFSA, it is a personal investing account, which we have always advocated as being the very last place that you want to invest your money, but here we go. In Canada, 50% of the value of capital gains are taxable. So remember, you buy a stock for $100, it appreciates to $150, and you sell it, $50 there is your capital gain, multiplied by the number of shares that you purchased you'll need to add 50% of the capital gain that you made to your income. This means that the amount of additional tax you actually pay will vary depending on how much you're making and what other income sources you have. So the more money you're making, the higher your income, the more this will affect you. For dividends, 
dividends are a little bit more complicated. And this question, because of its complication, we may, if we get enough questions, do a full podcast on this later because it definitely has its nuances and is important for investing. But dividends are taxed at lower rates. They're actually taxed preferentially for $75,000. If you have a eligible dividend, which basically means it's from a Canadian company. It is more complicated than that, but for the intensive purposes of this podcast, let's just say if it's a Canadian company and it's major, it's an eligible dividend. It's taxed at about 6% if you made $75,000. Non-eligible, so we'll just call this again for simplicity, non-Canadian companies, taxed at about 20%. At the end of the day, all of this will be added to your income and increases how much you owe in income taxes. And this really does illustrate how powerful the TFSA and the RRSP are as tools where these fees or these taxes don't exist. So make sure that you're using your TFSA and your RRSP. Do your best to contribute whatever you can. Um, But it really is a powerful tool to have that compounding happen to be able to not pay these taxes and be able to still grow that retirement nest egg or other funds that you're using to save for, for a home or those big purchases. Now we've talked about you know, how we calculate what we need to pay. Let's talk a little bit about the payments that we actually need to make. Now, some people make quarterly payments to the CRA. What do we do with those quarterly payments? So this might be the easiest one. And with those quarterly payments, all you do is add them up and put it in the column for income taxes paid. Remember that the whole point of this was to give you a little bit of insight for come April, exactly what you're going to be in for. As we know, If you make quarterly installments, that is a conservative estimate based on the previous year of taxes that you made. Because this year is likely to be higher than it was last year because of the hit kind of all healthcare professionals took in 2020, what your quarterly installments are going to be, what they were asked of by you from the government, might be an undershoot. So you might actually owe a little bit more. And it's good to have that kind of insight. So you can head to any Canadian income tax calculator. TurboTax has one. Well Simple has one. There's a bunch of them on the internet. Make sure that they're Canadian and the province of residence is the one in which you do reside. If you're self-employed, put the money down in self-employment income. Put in your RSP contribution. Put in any gains, capital gains, or eligible dividends that you made. Put in any income taxes paid. And it will tell you what you're in for. And then you can manipulate those numbers by lowering your income through deductions or increasing your RSP contribution to figure out exactly kind of how you want to shift what you owe and maybe move a little bit of money around. But more importantly, you'll be more aware of what's coming down the pipe for you in a couple months. And if you're listening to this podcast and thinking that these things are really complicated, you're not wrong. Um, And this is why accountants exist and why a good accountant is worth their weight in gold. So if you feel like this isn't necessarily the right thing for you to do or that you want to take on on your own, Make sure that you find an accountant that knows what they're talking about when it comes to self-employed healthcare providers, if you're self-employed, or employees who work on commission versus salaried employees. Find that person that understands your, your role and your job so that they can help you with the deductions and making sure that you're set up to pay the right amount of tax. Because this isn't about cheating the government. This is about just paying the government what you actually owe them. So make sure that you speak to someone that knows what they're talking about and you'll be safe. Thanks for taking us through this today, Ryan. Um, I'm going to go start cataloging my receipts right now, and uh, I'll catch you next week. Sounds good. I'll see you next week. If you have any questions for us about this podcast or would like to suggest topics for future episodes, please use our contact page. You can also email us directly. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast and check the link in the description for the show notes. Thanks for listening.